Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Jamie Green. Setting off, sir. Two weeks ago, the SNP government admitted that hundreds of criminals had received the wrong assessment on the risk they posed to the public. Assuming that all records have now been fully reviewed, can I ask the First Minister, one, how many criminals were given a lower risk assessment than they should have been, and two, how many were freed from prison before it was safe to do so? First Minister. Well, of course, the Justice Secretary has already uh, given much of this information uh, to Parliament, both in his statement and then in his appearance before the Justice Committee, uh, but I'm happy to confirm uh, the details uh, as we understand them at this stage. Uh, following a review by the Scottish uh, Prison Service, we can confirm that there are no public protection issues uh, as a consequence of this issue in relation to the eight identified uh, first grant of temporary release cases. Um, that involved, uh, as I say, eight cases. I uh, heard uh, Jamie Green uh, just a couple of weeks ago ask uh, where, uh, who these eight people were and where they had been released to. So I can confirm uh, today, uh, Presiding Officer, that of these eight uh, individuals, uh, seven of them are actually still in custody uh, as we speak. Because, of course, uh, first grant of temporary uh, release is not final release. It is about allowing some form of limited access to the community for the first time, often escorted access perhaps for a few hours. Uh, all 285 open cases uh, that the risk uh, scoring level issue appeared uh, to have affected have also now been checked uh, by social work professionals and they have provided assurance again that no public protection issues have been identified. Um, in terms of uh, the specific question about the risk uh, scoring, uh, of course, it is important, and this is a key fundamental point uh, that I know Jamie Green will understand, a decision uh, to grant release would never uh, be solely determined by the displayed score. Uh, in this case, it is a more holistic assessment of wider circumstances, um, and following that decision, of course, there is then a, a process of ongoing and dynamic risk assessment and management. So this was a serious issue that was identified. Uh, the steps that I have just outlined uh, have been taken. Uh, and of course, if there is further information to share with Parliament, uh, we will do that speedily as we have done to date. Jamie Green. It is all very well saying there were no public protection issues, but the reality is we still do not know, First Minister. We do not know how many people were wrongly released. We also do not know how many of them possibly went on to re-offend in our communities. I am afraid this blunder is just another sign that this government has lost its way on justice, because it is not just letting criminals out early by accident. Half of violent criminals avoid jail completely. And even when they do go to jail, the SNP's latest proposal is to cut automatic early release even further, so they serve even less time in prison in the first place. Now, the First Minister will probably reply and say there is a consultation out on this. But let me, ask, let me ask the First Minister for her own personal view. Does she think it is morally right that serious criminals are automatically released just a third of the way through their sentence. First Minister. Firstly, before we move on from the IT issue, uh, Jamie Green uh, tries to say it is all very well to say that there were no public protection issues identified. I actually think that is the fundamentally yeah. important uh, matter to address. Jamie Green has uh, also been raising questions about uh, the eight uh, individuals who were identified that had been given first grant of temporary release. I have confirmed to Parliament today that of those eight, seven of them actually are still behind bars in jail in custody. Um, and yet no response at all to that because it doesn't fit the narrative that Jamie Green uh, wants to share uh, with Parliament. Uh, these are important issues. Uh, information was shared appropriately uh, with Parliament. That will continue to be the case. Um, as this whole issue is reviewed, but actually being able to give an assurance uh, to the public that there were no public protection issues, I think is important, whether or not it fits the Tory narrative uh, of this issue. Um, in terms of the wider issue, of course, it was this government that ended uh, the system of uh, automatic early release that actually, I believe, a previous Tory government had actually introduced. Um, and it does not uh, bear any scrutiny to say that in Scotland, 
uh, we take a light-touch approach uh, to prison. We have one of, if not the uh, highest proportionate, uh, highest prison populations in the whole of Western Europe, which is why we are focusing so much on doing more about rehabilitation and preventing re-offending. Um, sentences are, of course, a matter for courts and for judges to take. What is important is that we have the right statutory legal framework in place and we continue to take the steps to ensure that that is the case. Jamie Green. I, I asked the First Minister a simple question. If she thought it was morally right that people should be released from prison just a third of the way through their sentence. That is a current SNP government proposal that is out there. And I didn't hear an answer to that, so perhaps she can pick that up in the answer to my next question. She says she doesn't really have a view, clearly, but she used to have a view. The First Minister in 2015 said, I quote, our objective remains to end the policy of autom automatic early release as soon as we are able to. So what's changed, First Minister? The problem is here is that the whole system, the whole system is stacked against victims right from the very start. Because, First Minister, they can't even get their court cases heard in the first place. We now have the worst court backlog on record, sitting at over 43,000 cases. Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service tell us it will be 2026 before that backlog uh, is cleared. And that is just prolonging the agony for victims. Of course, COVID made it worse. But let me tell you, there were tens of thousands of cases in that backlog before the pandemic even started. So it cannot be used as an excuse. First Minister, is justice for the victims of crime even a priority for this government anymore? First Minister. Well, firstly, we are, of course, investing in a recovery fund, investing more than £50 million to tackle the backlog caused uh, by COVID. And we'll continue to work with the court service uh, and indeed the whole justice community to do that. But let me go back to the issue of early release, because I find the Tory hypocrisy on this utterly breathtaking. And let me set out very clearly exactly why. Uh, back in 2016, uh, this government, this SNP government, reformed release arrangements for prisoners serving long-term sentences. What that meant was that the most dangerous prisoners no longer received automatic early release, and that ended a system that was introduced by a Tory UK government in 1993. So that's the background, presiding officer. Why do I think the Tory position is hypocritical today? Is because when we did that in 2016, the Tories in this chamber voted against that change. They voted against that change that scrapped automatic early release uh, for the most dangerous long-term uh, prisoners. And that change is not affected uh, by the proposals that we have consulted on. So we will continue to take appropriate decisions about our justice system, making sure that the most dangerous and uh, serious criminals uh, do serve sentences in prison, but that we also support and promote rehabilitation uh, to cut re-offending. We have one of the lowest uh, crime rates. We still have one of the highest prison uh, populations, but we will continue to take the action, whether the Tories support it or not, uh, or simply indulge in rhetoric, as they are doing today, of course, is a matter for them. Jamie Green. So, so the only hypocrisy in this chamber today is the First Minister, who said on record that she would end automatic air release and now refuses to rule out letting people out of prison after just a third of their sentence. Our party are clear on this. We believe that automatic air release is not fair, not fair for the victims of crime, Health Minister. Justice is not a priority for this government. We know that. And we know that because we have a freedom of information request that was responded to by the Scottish courts. They clearly stated in that FOI, and I quote directly from their paper, justice is no longer a priority. It's there in black and white. And we know that the facts back that up because our courts were shortchanged by £12 million in this year's budget. And let me tell the First Minister who is impacted by decisions like that. We've spoken, we've spoken to a woman who is taking a convicted domestic abuser to court. She has been waiting for three years for justice. Her case has been delayed 18 times. 18 times it's been postponed. She told us that it, this now feels like court-sanctioned abuse. It's a shocking case, but she's not the only one, because today we've learned there's more evidence that she's not the only one. A BBC investigation has uncovered that victims of domestic abuse and sexual violence are actually asking to drop their cases because the court delays 
are so long. So isn't it the case, First Minister, that the Scottish courts were right all along? Justice simply isn't a priority for this government, and it should be. First Minister. Firstly, Presiding Officer, um, just to complete the point on early uh, release, automatic early release, uh, what we committed to, as I uh, set out very clearly in my previous answer, we actually delivered and implemented in 2016 so that the most dangerous prisoners serving long-term sentences no longer get access to automatic early release. And I say again, uh, that is not affected by uh, what we have consulted on, but also at the time that was actually voted against by the Conservatives in this chamber. Uh, there is a serious uh, backlog uh, caused and certainly exacerbated by COVID in our court service, and we are very focused uh, with the, the court service and the wider justice community in addressing that. And I know everybody who works in our court service, uh, everybody who works in the Crown Office, is very seized of the importance of prioritising domestic abuse and violence against women and children cases. And these are uh, very serious cases, and I absolutely recognise uh, that. That is why uh, we have invested in the Recovery Fund. It is why, in the budget, we are increasing the resources available uh, to the court's service so that they can tackle that backlog um, and for as long as it takes. Uh, and we hope that there will be ways we can accelerate uh, that process. Uh, that will be a priority for us. More generally, uh, Presiding Officer, and this is my final point, um, I don't think it is right for anybody to downplay the seriousness of the impact of crime on victims, and I never will. Uh, any victim uh, of crime is one too many, and the personal impact on them is serious. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it is because of the priority we have given to justice in this government, uh, not least, of course, increasing and maintaining uh, an increase in the number of police officers uh, on the beat, um, and uh, a range of other initiatives that we have one of the lowest rates of crime, uh, including violent crime, uh, for many, uh, many years. So we will continue to take balanced and sensible decisions to make sure those who deserve to be in prison are in prison, but we also uh, promote and support wider efforts to reduce reoffending and support rehabilitation, because that actually is in the long-term interests uh, of potential and actual victims of crime. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Across the country, people are worried about the cost of living crisis. Prices are rising every day, and each weekly shop or trip to the petrol station is leading to anxiety and stress for many. And we know that over the course of this year, things will only get worse. Petrol costs will rise further, food prices are going up, and energy bills will rise by at least £700. Both of Scotland's governments need to be doing much more to help. We have published detailed plans for action from both the UK and Scottish governments. Next week in the spring statement, the Tory government must cut VAT on fuel bills, scrap the national insurance increase, reverse the cut to universal credit and introduce a windfall tax on oil and gas companies making billions with the money going directly into people's pockets. Will the First Minister finally instruct her MPs to back Labour's plans? First Minister. Um, my MPs uh, in the House of Commons just yesterday uh, led a debate calling for a windfall tax, not just on oil and gas companies, uh, but on any uh, company that had made substantially increased uh, profits as a result either uh, of the current global situation or indeed of the effects of the pandemic. Uh, they literally uh, led that call in the House of Commons yesterday, and I have made clear my views on that in response to Anna Sarwar previously. I hope we can unite in this parliament to call on the Chancellor next week to make very substantial and significant interventions to help the families across uh, Scotland and indeed across the UK who are struggling with the rising cost of living. For our part, although our powers and resources are very limited, we will continue to do everything uh, we can, including, of course, the 6% increase in the benefits under the control of Social Security Scotland that was announced uh, yesterday. So we will take the action we can, but across this Parliament, all of us should be calling on the Chancellor to do much, much more when he gets to his feet in the House of Commons next week. Anna Sarwar. Well, SNP MPs clearly didn't get the memo because repeatedly they were asked yesterday in Westminster whether they backed a windfall tax on oil and gas companies, and repeatedly they refused to confirm that they do. So they seemed to they didn't back a costed plan for a windfall tax on multinational oil and gas companies, but they did present one paragraph that would have taxed Iron Brew and Pets at home. I have no idea why the SNP back a tax on ginger but not on gas. I think, frankly, Scotland deserves better. Uh, the Scottish Government has the power to act too. 
had the SNP followed just one of our proposals, it, this is serious, Mr. Swinney, so perhaps you should listen. Had the SNP followed just one of our proposals, those most in need would have been receiving £400 directly into their bank accounts. But instead, the SNP flagship cost of living policy is to copy the Tory policy and provide £150 through a council tax rebate, a policy that the Poverty Alliance has called misguided, a missed opportunity and deeply disappointing. And now we learn that not a single person in Scotland will receive £150 in April. Instead, almost every council will have to split this over 10 months. That means the Scottish Government's flagship cost of living policy is worth just £15 for the next 10 months. At the same time, which have said this morning that Scottish families will be spending an extra £84 a month on food and fuel. First Minister, people are struggling right now. How can you possibly believe this is good enough? First Minister. First, in terms of the £150 payment, and the Finance Secretary has set this out very clearly, because of the limited uh, powers and limited control over the data around this that we have, we have done it in a way that gets help to people as quickly as possible, rather than it taking months and months and months. Of course, where we hold the power, uh, we are doing so much more. We are doubling the Scottish Child Payment, for example, helping lowest income families uh, with children. Uh, we, unlike uh, the government south of the border, have protected the council tax reduction scheme so that there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands uh, of households across Scotland who don't pay any council tax at all. So where we have the power, uh, we use that power. Uh, and where the power is limited, unfortunately, we can't act in the way that we would want. Which brings me back to the windfall tax. Uh, because uh, I don't know whether Anna Sarwar actually read the motion that was tabled in the House of Commons by uh, SNP MPs yesterday calling for a windfall tax uh, on any and all companies that have made increased profits, which would include oil and gas. Uh, but why, and this is perhaps something that Anna Sarwar might want to reflect on, yes, let's include oil and gas, but why would he want to exclude Amazon, for example, from that approach? Uh, but coming back, my final point, presiding officer, is this. Uh, wouldn't it be so much better uh, rather than Anna Sarwar standing up week after week asking for my views on something I have no control to do, rather that, uh, wouldn't it be better if Anna Sarwar would argue for these powers actually to be in the hands of this government in the first place? Anna Sarwar. I hate to break it to the First Minister. The cost of living crisis is right now. There isn't an independence answer or constitutional answer to this question. People's bills are going up whether they voted yes or no. And simply just pointing at the Tories and saying, well, they could have acted, but not using their own powers here simply isn't good enough. Because what the First Minister says, what the First Minister says on £150 is simply not true. They could have used that more progressively, as the Poverty Alliance has said. And what she says on the windfall tax isn't true. Repeatedly, SNP MPs were asked to confirm whether a windfall tax would include oil and gas companies, and repeatedly they refused to do so. Why? Why on the side of the big oil and gas companies and not on the side of people paying their bills? Because, presiding officer, people's energy bills are going up by £700. Fuel is estimated to go up to over £2 a litre. Food prices are on the rise, and at the same time, we have two governments lacking ambition. Failing to back a windfall tax on the big energy companies that put money in people's pockets. Failing to use its budget to support those most in need. Making it worse by hiking rail fares and water charges and failing to back detailed and costly plans just because they come from Labour. This crisis is only getting worse. Warm words won't keep the bills down. This government must step up to the challenge that Scots face right now. Stop tinkering around the edges and provide the support the people of Scotland need. First Minister. The power. We're using the power. We are doubling the Scottish child payment. The game changer policy according to child poverty campaigners. So where we have the powers, we use that power. But Anna Sarwar says the, the argument about powers doesn't matter. He has chosen to come here today and major on the issue of a windfall tax. This government doesn't have the power to impose a windfall tax. And let me be very clear, uh, the motion tabled in the House of Commons yesterday by SNP MPs would include oil and gas companies. Any reading of that would lead anyone to that conclusion. But here, in the interest, because this is a really serious issue uh, for families across the country, so in the interest of trying to build consensus, I will uh, prepare and sign this afternoon a joint letter with Anna Sarwar uh, to the Prime Minister and the Chancellor asking if they would pass 
us uh, asking them to do a windfall tax, but asking them, because I suspect their answer will be no, to give the power to this Parliament yeah. to do it at our own hand. And then we can join forces and ensure that that is actually done with oil and gas companies and with Amazon and with other companies that have increased. So rather than just indulge in the rhetoric, will Anna Sarwar actually argue for the means for this Parliament to do it? I'd be grateful, Chamber, if we could remember that we behave um, in a courteous and respectful manner to one another at all times. And we'll now move to supplementary questions, and I call Christine Graham. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the Serious Adverse Events Review and the subsequent NHS Lothian's Action Plan published recently following the death of my constituent Amanda Cox on 10 December 2018, shortly after the birth of her son. Murray, when she became disorientated, but it took seven hours to find her in a stairwell, dying from a brain haemorrhage. Does she agree the recommendations in the action plan, better hospital CCTV, I mean, these are disgraceful, you've got to put these as recommendations, better signage, observation of headaches in pregnant women, for example, while they came more than three years too late for my constituents, that every NHS board in Scotland should not only be aware of these recommendations, but act on them so nothing like this happens again, which will give the family some very slight comfort after this dreadful tragedy. First Minister. Uh, yes, I very much agree with all of that, and thank Christine Graham for bringing this tragic issue to the Chamber today. The death of Amanda Cox was heartbreaking, um, a, a tragedy, and I want again today to convey uh, my thoughts and sympathies to her family. It's absolutely imperative that all health boards ensure that all steps are taken to ensure that that is not ever repeated. Uh, last year, we published the maternity and neonatal uh, perinatal adverse event review process for Scotland, uh, which will standardise and improve approaches to the review of any adverse events in maternity. We also continue to prioritise improvements uh, to care through the implementation of the maternity and neonatal Best Start programme in partnership with senior leaders and clinicians. Uh, this group is currently producing Scotland-wide standards of care for the management of women who present with neurological conditions, including headaches, and care pathways for women who present with acute medical conditions, including uh, those who present to a and &E. uh, None of that uh, will lessen the pain and the grief of Amanda's family, but I hope it does give them some assurance that lessons are being learned uh, to try to ensure uh, that a tragedy like this never occurs again. Finlay Carson. In the last few hours, there's been worrying events emerging with regards to P&O fer ferry services and their staff. Of particular concern to me is the Cairn Ryan to land crossing in my constituency of Galloway and Western Fries. Uh, the Scottish Government need to take their transport resp responsibility serious with regards to Cairn Ryan, as this is a lifeline ferry service and a major employer in the South West. Can I ask if the First Minister is aware of the situation and what discussions, if any, the Scottish Government has had with P&O? And I ask for assurance that the Scottish Government will work constructively with the UK Government to ensure that both Stena and P&O can operate from Cairn Ryan long into the future. First Minister. Um, obviously, I am aware of what has been reported about an announcement that will come from P&O later today. We have uh, sought to engage with the UK Government uh, this morning. Uh, to seek further details. Uh, we will, of course, uh, seek to engage fully with P&O as more detail uh, emerge. Uh, obviously, for Scotland, uh, the relevant issue here is the Cairn Ryan uh, Larn route, um, and we will pay particular attention to any implications for that. That obviously supports a, a number of sailings uh, every day. Um, so we will keep Parliament updated as we get more detail. Um, obviously, we have to await uh, that detail, uh, but this will also be a seriously worrying time for those who work uh, for P&O. Know, and I uh, certainly hope uh, that what we are seeing here, I know this has been a difficult time with the pandemic uh, for ferry operators, and I don't underestimate that, but I hope we are not uh, about to see uh, a mass scale fire and uh, rehire uh, situation. Uh, so this will be a worrying time for everybody, um, and we will engage very closely with all those involved and, of course, keep Parliament fully updated. Paul O'Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I have been contacted by constituents working in Test and Protect in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Following the First Minister's announcements on Tuesday, management told staff that they would be made redundant and would only have four weeks' notice of this. Um, that very evening, staff received this, quite frankly, tone-deaf letter providing a web link for Redundancy Scotland. 
I understand that this has not been the case in other boards who have confirmed continuing employment until September and indeed redeployment within the NHS. After almost two years of working to support people and protect all of us, and in the midst of the worst cost of living crisis in memory, surely these key workers deserve better than a web link and a thank you letter. Can the First Minister provide clarity on whether Test and Protect staff will be redeployed to other roles across the NHS where they can continue the vital work that they have been doing so far? First Minister. Well, I expressed, uh, not for the first time, and uh, I'm certain not for the last time, my deep and enduring gratitude to everyone who has worked in Test and Protect over uh, these past two years. It is vital and, and part of the reason for our longer transition um, in testing is to ensure that we treat staff uh, fairly. I'll certainly look at the uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, material. It's important that all health boards and the Scottish Government will ensure this is the case, uh, engage uh, properly uh, with uh, those staff. Uh, and of course, uh, these services are coming to an end uh, in England at the end of March. We have extended for public health reasons, but also uh, to ensure that we treat staff as fairly uh, as we possibly can. Yes, we will be seeking to redeploy as many uh, staff as possible and as many uh, who want uh, to have roles elsewhere. We need people working in our broader uh, health and social care system right now, and there will be opportunities uh, for staff there. Uh, but let me again uh, express my gratitude to everybody who has worked to help us uh, through this pandemic over uh, the past two years years, as we see from the pressure on our NHS right now, it is possible uh, in terms of impact on our NHS. Uh, this week will be perhaps the toughest in the pandemic uh, so far, um, and everybody who is working to help us through is doing a sterling job, and they have the deep gratitude of me and this government. Co -cap Stewart. Um, as the war on our continent continues, it was a, a source of at least some comfort uh, yesterday to hear of Scotland's plans for welcoming uh, Ukrainian refugees. Can I ask the First Minister what lessons the Scottish Government's current approach has taken from the experience of the Syrian resettlement scheme when each local authority settled families in their area? First Minister. As I said yesterday, we are drawing very heavily on the lessons uh, from the Syrian resettlement scheme, which I think most people agree uh, overall was a success, uh, but there will be uh, lessons uh, to learn about things that can be improved on as well. Uh, the, the, reason, uh, the reasons that we have put the super sponsor proposal uh, to the UK Government, and of course we're still working on the agreement of the detail uh, of that, is, is firstly to expedite uh, the ability of Ukrainian refugees to come here, but also to make sure we uh, can operate in a holistic way. We are working very closely right now with local authorities uh, and with other partners to make sure there is uh, a real local focus uh, to this, because I know all parts of Scotland are keen to give a warm welcome to those fleeing uh, the horrors in Ukraine, um, and I think the approach we are taking uh, enables as many people as possible to do that. Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Tim Rideout, a senior SNP adviser, made appalling racist comments about the Home Secretary. Yeah. Such comments have no place in society, let alone in political debate. I welcome that the SNP has taken quick action in suspending and launching an investigation into Mr Rideout's conduct. But racism is never an isolated incident, and this, this is something all parties must condemn. So while the First Minister assure BAME communities in Scotland and the broader public that her party will continue to root out and condemn toxic, racist political discourse. First Minister. Uh, yes, I will. Uh, the individual concerned, uh, as Pam Gosso has uh, fairly pointed out, was immediately suspended from the SNP. It would be wrong for me to comment any further. Uh, I represent uh, the most diverse constituency in the whole of Scotland in this parliament. I represent the, the biggest uh, BAME communities uh, in the, the country. I understand uh, these issues. I understand how serious uh, it is that all parties take uh, these issues very seriously. Um, and I am absolutely uh, committed to doing so. I think this is an issue for all parties. Uh, we all have to uh, be prepared uh, to act uh, when necessary in a way that aligns uh, with what we say around these things. Um, and I, for my part, uh, probably speaking more as leader of the SNP presiding officer here than as First Minister, uh, I am determined that my party does so and I would call on other parties to make sure uh, that they always follow suit as well. Uh, and that, uh, I think, is something hopefully we can unite on. Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
Can the First Minister confirm what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that shortfalls in government funding of non-self-funded care homes places are not being made up for by unaffordable raise in the cost of care for self-funders? First Minister. Um, I, I'm happy to uh, reply to the member in uh, more detail, but of course uh, we are continuing to work very closely with uh, all in the social care sector to deal with uh, current pressures. Uh, free personal and nursing care, of course, is a key part uh, of how we fund social care in Scotland, and uh, we increase the rates uh, for that. In terms of self-funders, uh, the thresholds uh, that apply here um, are uh, different and better uh, from the point of view of self-funders than they are in other parts of the UK. Uh, so I think we've got a strong foundation here in Scotland, but we recognise as we work towards the National Care Service that there is more work uh, to do, and that is what we are very focused on achieving. Question number three, Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, Tuesday. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful for that reply. We learned this week that when it comes to child and adolescent mental health services across Scotland, almost a third of children are not seen in time. In Glasgow, Forth Valley, Dumfries and Galloway, it's more like half. Thousands of young people are waiting more than a year. Presiding officer, we may be just days away from welcoming hundreds of children from Ukraine. Many will be separated from parents, suffering bereavement and dealing with untold trauma. They may be here with us for years and they will certainly need access to calms. It is to this government's shame that they too will have to join the longest queue in the National Health Service. We have been warning about this crisis for years. In this time, the First Minister has failed a generation of Scottish children. It's beginning to look as though this government just doesn't care enough about this. Why should we trust that this will get any better, either for Scottish kids on list now or for those Ukrainian kids arriving soon? First Minister. These are issues of the utmost seriousness that are treated uh, as such by this government. So since this government took office, NHS funding on mental health has increased by 65%. Uh, staffing has increased uh, by 83%. Uh, we take these issues extremely seriously. Uh, the issue around uh, waiting times, uh, the, the waiting times and the proportion of young people not yet been seen within 18 weeks it is not good enough. Um, yes, the pandemic has impacted on that, but we know we had challenges uh, before the pandemic. Uh, but I think it is important uh, not to take away from that. I'm not trying to take away from that. But it is important to note in terms of the statistics uh, this week that although the proportion seen within 18 weeks uh, had fallen, and we do need to address that, the number actually seen was the second highest uh, ever. So what we face here is a situation where we are seeing more uh, young people, uh, but the demand for mental health services is also rising. Many countries are facing that, and that is what we need to address. That is why that additional funding, that additional staffing is so important. But so too is the, the redesign work we are doing, investing more in prevention and early intervention. So all schools now having access uh, to counsellors, that's important. And of course, the continued investment uh, set out in the recovery and renewal plan uh, to continue to build that capacity. So this is a big challenge uh, for all countries. It was big before the pandemic. It's even bigger given the mental health impacts of the pandemic. Uh, that's why we will continue to ensure the funding, the staffing and the reform of service delivery to make sure that we are meeting it for children here now and for any children who might come to Scotland in future. Question number four, Fiona Hislop. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to reduce the waste of unsold durable goods in Scotland in line with net zero targets. First Minister. We are progressing a circular economy bill as a priority in this parliamentary session. We will uh, obviously consult on the contents of that bill in May. However, I can confirm it will include proposals uh, to ban the destruction of unsold durable goods. That aims to both prevent needless waste and it will also help support initiatives such as Fresh Start here in Edinburgh, uh, which provides goods that would otherwise be destroyed, as well as goods donated by the public to low-income households and those moving out of homelessness. 
Fiona Hislop. Reports from ITV last year revealed that Amazon destroys millions of items of unsold stock every year, products that are often new and unused. And in the face of a climate emergency, this makes no sense at all. So it is welcome that Scotland is keeping pace with other European countries and showing ambition in tackling this issue. So what lessons can be learned from countries such as France, which have recently enacted a ban on such waste? First Minister. Well, I think people were understandably concerned at reports uh, about Amazon, for example, when uh, those reports surfaced, SEPA investigated uh, those allegations, and while they did not find actual breaches of uh, regulation, they did make a number of recommendations and continue to work with Amazon uh, so that uh, they can comply with best practice. Uh, the French legislation has only recently come into force. Uh, however, we will look uh, at their experience and look to learn where we can. Um, including around uh, which products to target, how to encourage reuse of products and how to monitor and uh, regulate the proposal. Uh, we will also be seeking views and looking to learn from others more widely as part of the forthcoming consultation on the Circular Economy Bill. And I would encourage all members across Parliament to engage actively with it. Maurice Golden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, we all want to see waste tackled. The amount of waste is rising in Scotland and recycling has declined two years running. The Scottish Government has missed its 2020 household recycling target and even the 2013 target has not been met. Why? First Minister. Uh, we know um, all of these things are challenging, uh, but you know, if we look, for example, at the amount of waste going to landfill, that's at its lowest uh, since records began. We need to do more to maintain progress. progress. We've also just recently announced the uh, first investments from the Recycling Improvement Fund to improve recycling uh, and the quantity and uh, quality of that. Uh, so we continue uh, to press ahead uh, with all of that, including, of course, the deposit return scheme, uh, which will have uh, big impacts uh, on this. And uh, we encourage people across the country uh, to work with us as we ensure that we are uh, reducing waste, that we have a more circular economy um, and that people are choosing uh, to recycle um, in the way that we all want them to do. And we will back that uh, as government with the investment that is needed. Question number five, Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when the construction of the National Treatment Centres, which are due to open this year, is completed, whether they will have sufficient staff to begin to tackle the Scotland-wide patient backlog. First Minister. Uh, yes, uh, recruitment is already progressing well, and uh, I can actually tell the Chamber that a significant number, uh, around 200 of uh, the 1,500 uh, that will be required for the National uh, Treatment Centres, are actually already uh, recruited. Um, and the full complement uh, will be in place once the network of 10 National Treatment Centres are fully operational. Of course, over the next 12 months, three of the new centres will open their doors and start treating patients. Uh, that will include uh, the Inverness National Treatment Centre, which will be up and running by the end of the year. Uh, clearly, increasing specialist recruitment on this scale is not without its challenges. Uh, that is why we have provided the NHS with targeted additional funding to develop workforce supply and international recruitment. Edward Mountain. Uh, I thank the First Minister for that answer. And your comments about Inver Inverness are actually interesting, because this was announced in 2015, giving us ample time for training. So far, NHS Island have secured about 25 per cent of their team, 65 people, of 20 which come from their own resources, which only leaves about 200 to find. Does the First Minister agree with me that the Highland National Treatment Centre's staffing problems could have been answered by establishing a medical school in the Highlands, which I have been calling for for years. First Minister. We've increased uh, recruitment uh, and intake uh, to medical training. We'll continue to take uh, the right decisions in terms of overall uh, NHS workforce. But you know, I tell you what else would have helped NHS Highlands' uh, recruitment efforts over recent times, uh, and that is if the Tories hadn't taken us out of the European Union and stopped freedom of movement, because that is one of the biggest challenges being faced right now in recruiting people into our NHS and social care. And perhaps a bit of reflection on that point from the Conservatives would go an awful long way. Siobhan Brown. Thank you. Um, a new report showing that Scottish Government policies and lower childcare costs could reduce the cost of a child for low-income families by almost a third. 
Does the First Minister agree the full impact of these policies are being diminished? Ms Brown, Ms. Brown sorry. Um, this, this is a supplementary for, for a forthcoming question, so bear, bear with us just now. Um, can I call Jackie Bailey? Um, RCN Scotland say that the workforce strategy provides scant detail on how increasing the number of nurses will be achieved given the record levels of vacancies or how to retain existing experienced staff. Similarly, BMA Scotland notes that the workforce strategy, and I quote, says little about retention of staff, just one of the worrying gaps which suggests it certainly won't provide any relief in the short or medium term. Can I therefore ask the First Minister, are the RCN and the BMA wrong? First Minister. Uh no, I mean, these are uh, big challenges that we're working to address, and we're working very closely with organisations like the RCN and the BMA. Of course, the health board delivery plans for the strategy will set out a lot of the uh, detail of how individual health boards will go uh, about retaining and recruiting staff. And, of course, we have... Uh, already uh, seen a significant increase in the overall NHS workforce uh, under this uh, government, and that includes, of course, qualified uh, nurses and midwives. Uh, we're in a very, very difficult uh, recruitment climate right now for a, a whole host of reasons, not least the one I have just cited uh, in the, the previous answer. Uh, that is why we're investing in wellbeing support for staff so that we uh, can retain staff already in our NHS. It's why we're funding international recruitment campaigns um, and uh, domestic recruitment campaigns as well. So we will work uh, with RCN, BMA and other professional organisations and trade unions as we get more and more uh, staff into our NHS in the years ahead. Question number six, Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government anticipates meeting the interim targets set out in the Child Poverty Scotland Act 2017. First Minister. Uh, we'll actually publish the next Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan uh, for the period 2022 to 2026 uh, a week today. Uh, the Social Justice Secretary will make a parliamentary statement uh, to coincide with that. Uh, this is our second delivery plan. It will outline the transformational actions we will take uh, together, of course, with partners across the country to deliver on our national mission to tackle child poverty and meet the targets in the Child Poverty Act 2017. Uh, the plan will be underpinned by new economic modelling, setting out the anticipated impact of our actions in relation uh, to both relative and absolute poverty projecting poverty levels for these measures in 2023, which is, of course, the year that our interim targets are due to be met. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the First Minister for that answer, and I look forward to the publication of the plan next week. We, we didn't deliver devolution to leave powers on the shelf or blame others, and unfortunately I feel like this is what's happening. All of the work that has been outlined is laudable, but the fact is it isn't enough, and it's not just me saying this. The Fraser of Allender Institute, the government's own Poverty and Inequality Commission, swathes of third sector, and most recently, yesterday in the report on destitution and child poverty, the Trussell Trust, Save the Children and the IPPR, have all said the government will miss the targets if they don't change course. One child in poverty is too many, and one day too long. So today I urge the First Minister to change course, use all the powers of this Parliament to lift children out of poverty, not because they are targets, but because they are children. And I ask the First Minister today what different and specific actions will her government take to lift children out of poverty, meet the targets, and will those actions include an increase to the Scottish Child Payment to £40 in time to meet the targets as recommended in the report published yesterday? First Minister. Well, the Social Justice Secretary will set all of that out when she makes the statement to Parliament next week. Uh, Cabinet discussed this in detail uh, at its meeting uh, this week, uh, so we are uh, very focused on all of these issues. Um, it is really important that we uh, meet these targets, uh, and uh, Pam Duncan Glancy is right, not just because they are targets, but because we want to lift uh, every child that we can out of poverty. But it is simply not true, uh, and it is not fair by any objective standard to say that on this issue the Scottish Government simply tries to blame other people. We have uh, already doubled uh, the Scottish child payment, uh, and uh, that has been described rightly as game-changing. And we actually saw uh, the impact of the various uh, Scottish Government initiatives on this uh, set out in a, a report published just last week uh, by the Child Poverty Action Group, the Cost of a Child in Scotland report. And uh, that showed that the combined value uh, of Scottish Government policies, including our lower childcare costs, uh, will reduce the net cost of bringing up a child in Scotland uh, by up to 31%. Uh, that's almost £24,000 
for lower income families uh, once the Scottish Child Payment is doubled um, and the expansion of free school meals uh, is fully delivered. And here's what the author said. The rising cost of raising a child and the failure in recent years to match this with improvements in help from the state has left many families in the UK struggling to make ends meet. In Scotland, families are significantly better off in this regard as a result of Scottish Government policies seeking to address this problem. Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With a new report showing that Scottish Government policies and lower childcare costs could reduce the cost of a child for low-income families by almost a third, does the First Minister agree the full impact of these policies are being diminished by the damaging impact of Westminster control, toxic cuts and a spiralling Tory cost-of-living crisis, which the UK Government is not addressing in any meaningful way? First Minister. Siobhan Brown uh, puts her finger um, on the fundamental issue here. We now have an independent report saying that the impact of Scottish Government policies, the things we can do and are doing within the powers we have, are reducing the cost of raising a child in a low-income family by a third. That's the impact of having powers lying here in this Parliament. Uh, but that is being undermined because too many powers in this regard still lie in the hands of a Conservative government at Westminster who are taking money away from the lowest income families. So if we can reduce the cost of raising a child in a low income family uh, by 31% with limited powers over welfare, just think what we could do if we had all the powers and this parliament was independent. <laughs> We will return briefly to supplementaries and I call Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We have already heard about the Scottish Government's Victims Task Force report that highlights worrying levels of attrition with survivors dropping cases because of lengthy delays. I know that both the First Minister and the Justice Cabinet Secretary take this issue very seriously. But how can we better support survivors access to access justice, given that defendants can demand in-person trials causing further delays? And what can we do now to speed up non-harassment orders and interim interdicts or other emergency protections while the backlogs are addressed? First Minister. I, I think in terms of the laws that we have passed and the policies that we have put into place, uh, we are seeking uh, to make these improvements. I think there is more to be done. Of course, the uh, ordering of uh, interdicts, uh, interim interdicts or non-harassment orders. These are issues uh, for courts. I have already uh, said how seriously we take addressing the backlog, particularly for victims of domestic abuse um, or uh, violence uh, against women, sexual violence, and that is uh, very important. We are also, of course, increasing money to frontline organisations uh, so that women uh, in these situations uh, can have access to help and support. Uh, there is a great deal to be done here uh, to recover from uh, the pandemic and then get back on track uh, in making the changes uh, that this Parliament has made over many years uh, in many, in many uh, cases, world-leading uh, changes, because uh, there are too many uh, women who do suffer the impacts of domestic abuse, um, and it is absolutely incumbent on all of us uh, to make sure that the policies, the resources and the legislative framework is in place to better tackle that. And Stephen Kerr. HS Forth Valley has admitted that GP practices in Central Falkirk, Palmont, the Braes, Camelin and Stenhouse Muir are full. This followed an investigation into GP registration when a constituent could not access diagnosis and treatment after suffering chest pains due to a lack of a GP. Now, given the very welcome arrival of many thousands of Ukrainian refugees, what steps is the First Minister and her government taking to ensure that all people in Forth Valley can access a GP? First Minister. Uh, we, of course, uh, are working uh, towards a target of increasing uh, the number of GPs and all health boards uh, have a duty to make sure that patients have access uh, to general practice uh, services, and that will continue. Uh, and of course, and I hope we do uh, get the ability, it is still home office dependent uh, to start to welcome significant numbers of Ukrainians uh, here to Scotland, I hope from as early as this weekend. Uh, and part of the work that we are doing is to make sure that we do not just uh, provide them with the immediate support that they need, uh, but that we are planning that longer term support as well. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will be a brief pause before we move to members' business.